Hello and welcome back to CS 11737 Multilingual NLP. This time I'll be talking about active learning. So active learning is a type of learning that's a little bit different than the other types of learning we've been handling so far in this class. So just to give an overview of some of the types of learning we've covered so far, we have supervised learning where we could learn from input output pairs x, y, unsupervised learning where we can learn from inputs only x, you know, train a language model or some sort of other structured unsupervised learning model. We could also have semi-supervised learning where we do both. So we learn from input output pairs x, y, but we also do some sort of processing over unsupervised data x. And active learning is a bit different from all of these, which is that all of the data uh, strategies that we've talked about before assume that we have data that's already been annotated for us and we're just stuck with that data and we have to use it as is. Active learning, on the other hand, what it does is it allows us to query a human annotator to efficiently generate x, y examples from x. However, we can't just query this annotator infinitely, of course, otherwise we would just create as much data as we want and perform supervised learning on top of that data. So rather what we need to do is we need to query them as efficiently as possible and generate examples that are particularly useful for training. So just to go through the active learning pipeline, the way it works is we have some sort of labeled data, x, y. We perform training, we get a model. And from this, we have uh, unlabeled data. And we can run this unlabeled data through our model and perform some sort of data selection to get a small sample of our unlabeled data. We then run this data through the annotation process and get some new training data, which could be, then be fed back into the training of our model. And we can actually do this over and over again. So we could do as many iterations of this active learning as we would like. So why do we want to do active learning? So let's say if we did have that ideal scenario where we could annotate all the data that we wanted in the world, we will get something like what we have on the left side. So we have lots of labeled examples. Some of them are false, some of them are true. This is a case of binary classification. And we can see that essentially this allows us to learn a very good classifier. Now instead, let's say we could only get a very small number of samples that we could annotate. And in this case, let's say we sampled the thing on the top right here. So these would just be random samples. Maybe we got a slightly inopportune random sample. But what we can see here is now that we have six examples and using these six examples, labeled examples in the darker colors, we learn a classifier that's not all that great. It basically fails on many of the examples that we would like to classify. However, instead if we do something like the bottom where we can select the examples that are essentially the ones closest to the decision boundary, the ones that are hardest to classify, then this in fact allows us to do a better job. It allows us to learn a perfect uh, classifier with only a small number of examples, in this case five. So that's the general motivation here. If we are able to classify our kind of hard to classify examples, then that should also essentially allow us to um, classify some of the easier ones. So basically, in train, uh, doing these active learning methods, we have two fundamental ideas that are really important. The first one is uncertainty. We want data that are hard for our current models to handle. Uh, the motivation being that, you know, if we're able to do harder examples, we're probably also able to do easier examples. And also, you know, we want to improve our current models, so we want to pick the ones that they're less likely to get correct. In addition, we want to have some concept of representativeness. So we want data that are similar to other data that we uh, have in our set to be annotating. And I'll talk about both of these ideas in turn. So I'd like to talk about uncertainty and representativeness criteria. And within active learning, there's kind of two very major methods that people use. The first one being uncertainty sampling. And uncertainty sampling can essentially be run over a single model to find out where the model is most uncertain. And then the second example is query by committee, where we use different models and measure agreement between them. 
So there's a number of criteria that we can use. Uh, let's say we're talking about the simple case of classification or text classification. So the first one is entropy. And basically what entropy is, is if we want to calculate the entropy of a particular training example, we enumerate all of the output classes and we calculate the expectation of the negative log probability of all of these, in other words, the entropy. The second one is top one confidence. And the top one confidence essentially is we find the most confident output and then we calculate its uh, log probability or probability if we like. And the final one is margin. So essentially what we do here is we calculate the log probability of the most confident output, y, y hat. And then we also calculate the prob log probability of the second most confident output. And we calculate the difference between the two. So the idea behind this being that if we have one that has relatively high probability and others don't have high probability, then we still might be pretty confident in that uh, particular output. So notably, all of these uh, hx, top one x, and margin x can be calculated purely using x. They don't need the actual output. And this is very important for active learning, of course, because what we want to do is we want to calculate input examples that are uncertain without actually knowing their label in advance. Another example is query by committee. So query by committee, the basic idea is we run multiple models and measure the disagreement between the models. And how do we get multiple models? So one way to get multiple models, for example, in neural networks is to just train multiple models with different random seeds. There's other varieties of things that you can do, like you could train them on different uh, subsets of the data, or you could even use something like boosting, which uh, essentially tries to train progressively models on harder parts of the data, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, there's lots of ways to do this, but they all kind of boil down to creating multiple models and running them over the data and finding the data points for which they disagree. So as I said, uncertainty is an important element here and representativeness is the second important element. So the question becomes, how can we classify examples that are representative? And by this, what we mean is essentially examples that are similar to others in that if we label them, we will be able to get new examples that are we will be able to get labeled examples that are likely to improve our accuracy on other examples in the data set. And kind of, if we think about the contrast, if we just try to label examples that are hard in general, they might be outliers that would be very unlikely to appear in other parts of the data set. So this is kind of important to ensure uh, that we get bang for our buck. So in simple feature vector space, um, what we can do is we can calculate the feature vectors of each of the labels, uh, sorry, of each of the training instances. And we try to find vectors in feature space that are similar. So here's an example um, from training convolutional neural networks for image classification. So we take the convolutional neural network, extract a feature vector for the training example and calculate the similarity between them. And essentially what this allows you to do is say, okay, we want to cover training examples uh, in this vector space, and that will allow us to essentially ensure that we get other examples similar to the ones that we haven't covered well yet. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we can do this. Uh, so this is also applicable if we have a feature extractor, of course, like, you know, BERT or any other thing that can extract features from text, but there's also other ways to do this that are kind of like well tailored to low resource uh, natural language processing scenarios, which I'll talk about next. So active learning strategies for text and text processing tasks. So 
Before we talk about this, I think it'd be a good idea to talk a little bit about the prediction paradigms for language tasks. So the first one is text classification, where we take in a text and we predict a single label. So this is the relatively easy version of active learning. And what I mean by this is that we now have a problem that's very similar to all of the other classification problems in the world. And because of this, we can kind of apply our standard uh, text classification models, uh, sorry, uh, classification-based active learning methods. The second one is tagging. So in tagging, instead of having a single label, we have multiple labels. And this can be uh, multiple labels, one for each input word, and this can become a little bit more complicated because now we're not just predicting a single label and we need to think a little bit more carefully about what we're doing. The next one is sequence -to sequence models. So in this case, we have an input and we have an output, and the output might not necessarily be the same size as the input or even be kind of directly corresponding to any of the words in the input. So this becomes even harder in terms of how do we do active learning? How do we um, essentially learn the, uh, how do we select the data to be annotated and how do we annotate it? Okay, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about sequence level versus token level labeling. So for sequence labeling and sequence sequence models, we can do annotation at different levels. So the first is sequence level, which means that we might have a large corpus of data from which we want to pick the most informative sequence as a whole. And in order to do this, we would basically need to go in and annotate every word in the sequence. The second one is token level. And in token level active learning, we don't necessarily need to annotate every token in the sequence, but rather we can pick individual tokens and annotate only these tokens while leaving all the others unannotated. And the good thing about token level is it makes it possible to annotate just difficult parts of sentences, which could potentially lead to time savings because you don't have to annotate all of the other parts of the sentence. However, it requires strategies to learn from individual examples. So individual examples, normally we assume that they're fully labeled. So what do we do when they're not fully labeled? So first talking a little bit about sequence levels. Um, as I mentioned before, we need to have uncertainty measures and we talked about several different varieties. So for top one confidence, if you'll remember, this was the likelihood of the output that the model actually outputs. So, you know, if we have a translation system that outputs a particular translation, it says its probability is uh, 0.1 or 0.1%, uh, then our top one confidence would be 0.1% exactly. For uh, margin-based methods, uh, so this is relatively trivial to apply. We just output our top one and then we calculate its likelihood and, and we're done. For margin-based methods, um, we can do n-best search. So we can uh, find the one best and the two best and calculate the difference of likelihood between them. So this also is relatively straightforward. For entropy-based methods, it's non-trivial to calculate this exactly because in order to do so, we would have to enumerate all possible outputs. And because we're doing a structured prediction problem where we have a multitude of outputs, this would not be possible to do in a reasonable amount of time. So what we can do instead is we can enumerate over n best candidates. So we can output n best candidates and calculate the entropy over just these n best candidates. And if the cumulative probability that these n best candidates gets is relatively high, then the expectation in our entropy formula here will essentially be higher because we, or will be similar to the overall entropy because we'll have enumerated most of the things that get non-trivial probability according to this value here. 
Okay, so this is how we can build sequence level uncertainty measures for active learning. A next question that I brought up earlier is how do we train on the token level if we're doing token level active learning? So as I mentioned before, we get this partial data and there's a couple ways to handle this problem. The first one is to use unstructured predictors. So the basic idea being that we treat each prediction as independent and train only on the annotated labels. So we would calculate the loss, in this example, we would calculate the loss function for verb, but we would not calculate the loss function for any of the others here. This is simple, very easy to use. And in fact, if we have a strong enough uh, feature extraction model, uh, so say we're using BERT or some other strong feature extraction model, we actually might just be sufficient with this particular method. However, if we're using structured prediction methods, for example, CRFs, uh, we need some other way to handle this. And for methods that are based on dynamic programming like CRFs, there's actually methods that you can use to sum over all of the unlabeled tokens and kind of cancel them out when we're calculating the probability. However, it is less trivial to do this for other more complicated structured prediction models like sequence sequence models using attention etc and as far as i know there aren't really good methods to do this yet although that might be an interesting research topic so i talked a little bit before about representative metrics on the kind of feature vector level However, there's other ways that we could do token level representativeness metrics. And one very common way of doing so that's very easy and but nonetheless effective is we accumulate uncertainty over token instances. So for example, if we wanted to do a part of speech tagging task, the word run is rather, um, well, the word run could be ambiguous. It could have the meaning uh, of a noun or a verb where the verb is kind of the standard run and a noun might be a run in a stocking or uh, the, name of a, the name of a river, etc. So we could accumulate the uncertainty of run uh, over all of the instances of run and annotate a, an instance of the word that had the highest aggregate uncertainty over all of its uh, all of its tokens. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is sequence to sequence uncertainty metrics. So one of the major application areas or some of the major application areas that we've examined in this class are machine translation and speech recognition, which do need sequence to sequence uh, metrics. So there's a couple ways we can do uncertainty. Uh, one kind of representative one is back translation likelihood or accuracy. And this would be on the sequence level, uh, allowing us to select sequences for which the model is uncertain. And the way this works is by generating a one best output and calculating the back translation likelihood. So we take this one best output y hat here and we calculate the likelihood of the input given this. And if this likelihood is high, then we think that perhaps we did a good job of generating this translation. But if this likelihood is low, then we think perhaps we did not do a good job. And for machine translation, for example, it's also common and useful to calculate active learning or at least kind of representativeness metrics on the phrase level. So the way this would look like is essentially we would give an annotator this rather long sentence, but we would highlight a specific phrase within the sentence to allow them to translate into an output here. And there's a number of ways of selecting these phrases. Um, however, these methods tend to be somewhat rudimentary and essentially uh, the a common one that I've used in previous work that nonetheless seems to work well is if we have some machine translation training data already, we select the most frequent uncovered phrase. So in other words, the phrase 
that is the most frequent, but we do not yet have in our parallel training data. So this doesn't even use the model confidence at all, but it's nonetheless uh, can be useful. So another important thing, because this is a multilingual class, is to think about how to apply active learning methods to low resource languages. So of course, all of the methods that I described here are great for low resource languages, uh, as they allow you to create more resources effectively. However, we can do even better if we think about the intersection between cross-lingual learning and active learning. So essentially what this uh, method shows, what this paper shows is that if you take a standard active learning model, it will get accuracy, uh, active learning model with no cross-lingual transfer, it will essentially get accuracy corresponding to this green dashed line here. And you can see that you need quite a few annotations before you start you know, picking up and getting non-trivial accuracy. However, if you start off with a already trained cross-lingual model, we can then very rapidly improve upon this. And we can also, by combining active learning, we can do better than if we just, for example, randomly selected sentences in the language to use, and that's the yellow line over here. So you can see that basically cross-lingual transfer learning plus active learning is a good combination for adapting to low resource languages. So a final important thing to think about is because we're talking about active learning here and active learning essentially involves human annotators, how does our data sampling strategy essentially interact with our human annotators? So in simulation, if we're you know, just training a model and testing it for academic purposes, it's common to assess active learning methods based on the number of words or sentences annotated. So I can give an example here. This is the number of words an annotated. Uh, so we have 200 words, 400 words, 600 words, etc. And we assume that, you know, annotating 200 words uh, takes a certain amount of time. However, in reality, um, active learning, because it tries to intentionally go out of its way and select examples that would be useful for the model, it may select harder examples. And kind of in the extreme case, if we don't have a good uh, representativeness criterion, for example, it may select examples that are all just really, really hard, not only for models, but also for machines. So, you know, it will select sentences that are only punctuation or something like that and say, please tell me the sentiment of the sentence. Because of this, active learning selected data may take more time than data selected in other ways, and it might also have a higher chance of human error, uh, so we might get noisier labels if we ask a human to label them. So often, simulations overestimate the gain from active learning, and when you actually run it with a human annotator, your gains can be much less uh, effective. So there's a number of methods that try to directly consider cost in active learning. Um, so proactive learning, uh, essentially is a method that considers different oracles that cost different amounts for each. So, you know, we might have a super expert animator, uh, not animator, sorry, annotator, that does a really good job of annotating every time. At the same time, we might also have a crowdsourced annotator that does an okay job, but, you know, might fail on really hard examples. So we also have a paper where we took this a little bit further um, where we assign this to token level uh, active learning, where we create a model of annotation cost and accuracy gain for each span in different modes and choose the best spans or modes based on this. So essentially the way it works is um, we have different uh, spans of the input that we could be annotating and we can either uh, type them out for example, uh, or we could say them aloud, or we could skip annotating them altogether. And each one has a different amount of cost, which is uh, modeled based on the length of the sequence, the difficulty of the sequence, etc. 
and um, how much accuracy we would get from each of those. So it's possible to essentially model these things. Another final important thing to think about, oh, actually, sorry, before I, I move on to the next thing, there's one final thing that I'd like to talk about, which is in order to consider cost, another really important thing is how do you design your annotation interface, for example? So do you have a minimal number of clicks for the user to do? Um, or you know, is it attractive visually so they can easily process the information and understand what uh, they need to be annotating, et cetera. So this can be very, very important. Um, and it's something you definitely should think about if you're going to be designing an active learning strategy. So now that I've said that, uh, the final thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is reusability of active learning annotations. So because we're doing active learning, that means that very often we'll have a model in the loop deciding which data we should be annotating. And so if active learning annotations are obtained with one model, they may or may not transfer well to other models. So this is an example of text classification using three different classifiers. One is a BioSTM, uh, another is a CNN, and the final one is an SVM. So these are basically three different methods for text classification. And on the left side, we have an example of data acquired by training an SVM. In the middle one, we have uh, data acquired by training a CNN. In the final one, we have data acquired by training an LSTM. And what we can see is, interestingly, the data acquired by the SVM is uh, most useful for the CNN and SVM and a little bit less useful uh, for the uh, by LSTM. On the other hand, the data acquired by the BioSTM is useful, or at least moderately so, for the, uh, the LSTM, but the other two models do even worse than just randomly sampled data when trained on this data acquired by the LSTM. So this is an important thing to think about. You know, how likely is the data, the difficult to data, be, going to be to generalize across models that use very different learning paradigms. I kind of have an intuition with respect to this, although this isn't verified with empirical uh, evidence, but if we have an appropriately good representativeness measure, representativeness should in a way be somewhat transferable across models. And because of this, that might help uh, reduce issues uh, with respect to this and to some degree, but you know, it's an interesting question that you should definitely be thinking about if you're implementing these methods. So that's all the content I have for today. And for the discussion question, I'd like to go a little bit deeper into some of the papers that we've referenced. Uh, the first one is on cross-lingual transfer learning plus uh, active learning. The second one is evaluation of multiple active learning techniques for neural machine translation. And the final one is thinking about cost-sensitive active learning. So that's all I have for today and looking forward to the discussion in class.